Okay, we're here with the legendary Storm. Such a an honor to have you on the podcast. It's uh, it's kind of unbelievable. <laughs> you're a, you're. A Thank true, you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah honor is all on my side. Living legend and a, and a pioneer, and uh, I hope that people will get a lot from this talk. So yeah, thank you for, for taking the time to come on here. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we just start right off the bat with, for anyone who might not know who you are, maybe people outside of the dance realm or something like that, do you mind just going into a little bit of just background on who you are, how you found dance, etc. Um, okay, so well, I mean, uh, my name is Storm. My real name is Niels Robitsky. So uh, I'm I'm German. Come from Germany. I grew up in a, in a small town in North Germany, and uh, I was there until I was 14, 15 years old. Until I started dancing professional, uh, professionally, and uh, from that moment on, you know, like I, I always try to, I always try to be as far away from home as possible, you know, for different reasons. Uh, one reason was my family was falling apart and it was just not the nicest place to be home. Mm -hmm. But secondly, I realized um, that with my passion, you know, especially coming from a small town, there was not there were not many people around that could inspire me or that uh, where, where I, I knew that uh, that I could go any further. You know, mm -hmm. so there were there were their limits, you know, of course. Um, and uh, most of the people in small cities or in small towns, they also their their mindset is pretty narrow. You know, they they can't really see that you could make it in in the in a different realm than than themselves. You know, so you know, like they want you to just go the typical German way of you know, like okay, you finish your school, you start an apprenticeship, you become this, you become that. You know, and that was really not my destination. I have to say. Right. So I felt uh, with 14 already, I felt that uh, dancing was my vocation mm -hmm. and uh, I became professional three months later. I mean, I was dancing all my life, you know, I, you know, like in my, in my family, you know, like we have a lot of musicians. We were always playing music. And um, as long as I could remember, you know, like my mom was always uh, singing and dancing in the kitchen while she was while she was cooking or while she was doing anything else which was sometimes pretty bothering when you were making your homework in the kitchen <laughs> at the same time, but it was cool. You know, um, my father played clarinet and saxophone and banjo, um, you know, like, and, and my uncles and cousins and everybody was playing instruments and, okay. you know, um, so I grew up with music. Well, then at like at the age of, yeah, actually funny enough. Oh man, this is something I never told anybody. I think I was nine years old. When I was nine years old, uh, my 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 little girlfriend and me back then, I mean girlfriend, you know, nine right, years. Right. I was nine years old and me. The, the movie uh, Grease with John Travolta and Olivia okay. Newton-John came out. And, uh, and she really liked that song and she always wanted to dance with me. So I just said, like, well, let's come up with the choreography. Oh, wow. And we came up with the choreography and I was pretty embarrassed because she was telling everybody in school. And then one day we had to perform the choreography in school, like in class, which was funny. <laughs> but it was like my, you know, like my first exposure, basically, right, you know, right. I was embarrassed then, you know, like, I, you know, like, it's not that I felt that dancing would be my thing. But then my father also recalled that, you know, in the time when I was seven, eight years old, when I was playing soccer, mm -hmm. you know, I was it bothered me that I was like on an outer position on, I was playing on the outer right. So I never really got the ball. So mm -hmm. he wanted to pick me up from a game. And then he was, he, he just, he was just hiding, trying to find out like, what's my boy doing. And then he said, you know, like he was really shaking his head when he saw me because I wasn't part of the game. I was just dancing on the lines. He said, you know, <laughs> like on the outer lines, I was dancing around the, <laughs> You know, I was, right, right. you know, and I was like, really? He was like, yeah, man. From that moment, I knew, okay, football or soccer is nothing for him. Okay. So really, so that was interesting. You, you, you kind yeah. of knew, right? Yeah. See, this is what I mean. I, I didn't know then, but I kind of like, I would say that I really grew into it. Right. Uh, also because, you know, like I, I was listening to music anytime and i i also you know like i i actually i wanted to become a singer i wanted to become a musician you know that was my first goal mm -hmm. 
now um then i got i also like with 10 11 i got into into roller skating then after that i got into skateboarding but not like skateboarding like most of the people do it today you know like it was you know, i went right into that rodney mullen era where everybody was freestyle oh. skating so you were dancing on the skateboard and you were dancing with roller skates there was always yeah. music playing and you wanted to look smooth and you know the the biggest rule with skating at that time was that your foot was not supposed to touch the ground you know that was like a big no-no it's right. a bit like power movers you <laughs> yeah. know breaking yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know they also for them it's the biggest nightmare if it touches if the foot is touching the ground mm -hmm. so yeah so i grew into that so <clears> I, at that time also you know with skateboarding and with uh, roller skating we created choreographies we created routines so you know like i mean you know, this is what i mean i grew into that so so when i started breaking mm -hmm. when i started breaking and popping I was what already was this by the way that was in 1983 okay yeah I started in summer 1983 okay so when I got into that into breaking and popping uh, I was already quite used to like a certain formula on how you put things together to make mm -hmm. things look good and I think all my life I was intrigued by quality of movement mm -hmm. no matter what I saw whether it was karate kung fu mm -hmm. whether it was you know, like ice skating or whatever. I always looked at the quality of movements, trying to find out um, when somebody was doing something very well or rather not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a big part of it, of it was always that I realized that, you know, especially craft workers, that they, um, how can you say, that it was not just functionality in movement and that they started to economize you know like if you put a nail in your hand and a hammer and you start doing it in the beginning you know like you put all your body into it and you hit your thumb and you know like all these things so only after a while the more the more you embody the movement the more you cultivate what you're actually doing with the hammer and the nail the the more you know the, the fine motorics the dexterity starts to you know like you you, right. you you really explore the possibilities and you realize like oh for this nail i need a bigger hammer mm -hmm. and for this you know the big hammer white me too much let me get a small one and so you you learn how to adjust to the media so and you realize that with a lot of craft workers that they have that too where at some point in my life i thought like well basically everybody's dancing they just don't know mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah and uh yeah but you know i also got into kung fu i did kung fu for seven years and so on but yeah what really what what really got me into dancing where i knew like okay this this is it this is what i want to do this is what i want to do for a living was when i saw uh flash dance you know the the previews of flash dance and when i saw malcolm mclaren's buffalo gals back then with rocksteady crew dancing in it and I realized, all right, no, you know, like I, I, from that moment on, I dropped everything else. <laughs> I, I really just got into dancing. So, so in school, in school, I had trouble, small town boy, like I said, I had trouble that my teachers, they tried to convince me that I had to do something sensible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I had to learn a regular job. And but I just I, I think I was very resilient at that time already. I had a very hard head. Yeah, and I just said, like, no, I want to become a dancer. That's it, mm -hmm. you know. So whenever we had to, like, you know, like after school, I was just basically I was without a job for a year. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I remember that my father was telling me, look, if you don't have anything within the next two months, maybe you should go to the army, you know, which was compulsory at that time oh, wow. in, in Germany. And that's when, uh, um, yeah, I cheated my way out out of that and uh, I left home and Swift Rock and I decided that we wanted to become professional dancers. And that was the moment where we also realized since, see, we're talking about late eighties here. Mm -hmm. And in the late eighties, it was played out all over the world. Nobody wanted to see break in anymore or pop right. in. It was, it was done. You know, mm -hmm. people had such bad memories from the exploitation area, uh, from the exploitation era from 1984. Nobody really wanted to see that anymore. So we had, you know, or basically our strategy was that we had to work harder than anybody else just so that we would get that recognition. So from that moment on, I'm actually fighting for recognition so that our dances would be seen uh, as as something um, or, or, or 
as something as hard to, you know, like when, when you look at ballet dancers, mm -hmm. when you look at other people that are working physically, no matter what it is, and I mentioned it earlier, no matter what it is, um, you know, these art forms, they require a lot of practice, a lot of work and a lot of energy. And uh, yeah, so I just wish that one day, you know, like our dance forms become as established as they as they should be and right. that people don't just value our dance from from what they see but also the values that have grown from the south bronx or out of the south bronx until where we are now so that they could see you know like the the deeper values of uh what dancing could do to your your life as being part of uh, the society at large right right and that leads us to where we are today, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, still fighting, still fighting for that, for that. Mm. But it's, you know, it's to... a real exciting time to to be involved in the breaking community and, and even just to for other people to just see, hey, oh, I thought that thing was that dance that died in the 80s. Like it's still going around and and then you see where it is today. And it's a there's a lot of beautiful possibilities with it. It's really exciting. Right. Yeah. It's interesting to see, you know, like where, you know, like how many times, especially during these days, when people are talking about breaking at the Olympics, for instance, mm. when a lot of people, when they hear that breaking is going to the Olympics, most of the people they have in mind from what they've seen in the 80s. Yeah. They rather, when they hear breaking, they rather think of electric boogie or something, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, they think about white gloves and the baseball cap and stuff, you know, and people doing pantomime on the street and maybe a caterpillar on the floor. They have that in mind and they, cause they, you know, they lost track. They have no idea of what it looks today. Mm -hmm. So, and I realized that throughout my, my entire life, wherever I went, you know, when people were talking to me, you know, they were always like, oh, okay. Yeah. Very, very nice. You know, like philosophically this, uh, you know, you, so we we speaking philosophy, philosophy. We're speaking of you know, like different things, that, you know, all kinds of things in life, right? And so people talk to you, but from the minute they find out that you're you are the hip hopper, you are the break dancer or something, you know, when all of a sudden they change their behavior and they look different, mm -hmm. right? They look different at you, and uh, well, all these preconceived notions just come exactly from, like flooding. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think everyone who's ever been a, a dancer or a hip hopper or whatever has experienced some, something like that in their yeah. life. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, I mean, especially now, you know, like I'm 52 mm. years old, right? you know, and, and living in Berlin, you know, it's, it, it's still something else. In Berlin, it's fine. You know, there's so many freaks here. It's quite normal to be an artist. <laughs> yeah, but if you go to some, some other city in Germany or even within Europe, you know, mm -hmm. people find out or to some corporate meeting. Right. something like that and then people look at you and they go like okay so you must be an artist but what do you do mm -hmm. and you say like well okay i'm a dancer what kind of dance contemporary dance this and you know mm -hmm. like choreographer okay you have a dance company and then once they find out that you are into hip-hop and into breaking and stuff they sometimes they're really surprised or that you're that, that people call you by the nickname of storm you know <laughs> right, that's, right. that's another thing you know yeah, that's something yeah. else yeah i was just thinking about that too that you know like breaking you know, it comes from like kids made it basically, right? And yeah. it has a lot of that sort of, for better or worse, kind of like child, child's like spirit, I guess, Chill, like childlike spirit. So nicknames and, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's just, yeah, it, it dawned on me today when I was coming home. Like, oh. It's just, it's just an odd thing, right? That we call each other by these nicknames and stuff and and to us it's totally normal like it's totally normal to call you storm or call someone like i don't know right. switch or some some crazy name uh -huh. right but slick if, you know, <laughs> slick or yeah you know <laughs> swift rock or uh -huh. o one or any of these names right uh -huh. yeah but anyway um and most of the time we don't even know their real names right we only yeah, know them by their nicknames. But you know, like, what's a name, right? It's whatever you call someone. Yeah, but you know, you know, you know, I I had a deeper thought, and I don't know. Um, so I'm writing two books since six, seven years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, at first it was one book, and I wanted to keep it quite simple. But then I realized that I have so much to say. 
-hmm. and there's so much to research and you know like and and there's uh there's so much knowledge that people could grasp on where i think that they could somehow manage their life a lot better when they would just sink their head a little bit deeper into hip-hop mm -hmm. you know speaking about nicknames for instance you know that dawned on me around 10 years ago when my popping partner here in berlin his name is prince mio so when when he introduced me to his family and his father is very conservative when he introduced me to his family and he said well this is storm and my father, uh, his father was looking at me and he said, uh, your name is Storm? And I'm like, yeah. And he said, but that's your nickname. I was like, yeah, yeah. And then he was just like, okay. So that, that was the moment for me. It was much more that Mio realized how his father reacted to it. Mm. And what that must have meant to his father to meet somebody in the early 40s or like above 40 that has a nickname called Storm and everybody calls him that. So, you know, the way that grows with you, mm -hmm. but also the way it grows within other people mm -hmm. when they hear this guy is called Storm. There must be a meaning behind it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like not just that your nickname means something, but then, you know, like I got deeper into it where I realized how value, valuable it is in your life to create a nickname and then instead of acting in life or, or going through life always with your real personality with your real persona mm -hmm. going through it um having a nickname now where that nickname enables you to always be a little bit more playful mm -hmm. you know where yeah. if 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 you if you look at if, if you look at any moment you go to a hip-hop jam you go to a hip-hop jam and you step into a circle and you start a battle or something like that, that is not necessarily you with your whole background as a person, but no, it, you're stepping in there as storm, which is like, you know, in, in, in French, they call them peons, like the little figures that you have for Monopoly or something. You know, you play a society game, you roll the dice, yeah. and then you go like, okay, I have a 10 or something, and you go like 10 steps with your little thing. I don't know what the term is in English, but in French, they call them peons. Yes. Yeah. I doesn't matter. Doesn't yeah, matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so, so now it's a bit like that. You know, like you, you, you step into a battle, and it's not you, mm -hmm. right? But, but also at the same time, uh, with that alter ego that you are creating, with that alter ego that you're creating, um, with time, you become your alter ego. Yeah. So it's not just, you know, like that you're using it for play, but now the situations are getting more and more serious. You delve more and more into what you actually want to accomplish and so on. So you become more and more what you are. So where you where you have to ask yourself, is Superman actually Superman or is he Clark Kent? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, well, like who is he? There's, you know, you see it a lot in, in various cultures with like masks and in performance yeah. and things like that. Exactly. And they can be who they are. And then when they put on the mask, it's someone else there's someone else or i'm people who listen to the podcast will know this and people who know me personally they know i love pro wrestling and i love uh like lucha libre wrestling too it's like mexican style wrestling and the right. tradition is they all wear masks and uh, uh. i was just listening to an interview the other day and someone was asking them about like you know about the masks and stuff and they they were talking about kind of very similar stuff with that like you know, when they put on the mask, they become, they really become a different person. They take on this new persona and they're, they're someone else in the ring when mm. they're doing stuff. And you know. there's, there's another nice podcast for like, uh, I don't know if you know Tom Billier with uh, Impact Theory. Um, on his podcast, he invited, <clears throat> once he invited Kobe Bryant, mm -hmm. who was talking about Black Mamba. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. It's the same concept. Mm -hmm. So when Kobe Bryant went, in on the field and he's played his game he wasn't Kobe Bryant he became Black Mamba mm -hmm. you know and just from that concept you realize wow it's so powerful you know yeah. what it does to you to you know like it allows you it allows you to take that extra step you know mm -hmm. to work forward to work into a certain direction without putting your entire persona into it mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that's one of the major playful elements that we in breaking that we keep for the rest of our life yeah. where other people where they don't have that 
Yeah. You know, where they don't have that. So all of a sudden, you know, like you have to you have to hand in your credentials and it's everything that you as, you know, like me as Niels Robitsky, what I've done in my life or whatever. Am I am I qualified? Mm-hmm. But yeah, if they would if they would only know about Storm, <laughs> you know, it <laughs> yeah. would be a different story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and like I like what you said there with just a lot, like when you take on that new persona or whatever, or you step into that world of storm or whoever it is like you allow yourself to kind of play and and shed that that uh you know other person that you you are i don't know the rest of the day and uh you know Mm -hmm. it just really makes me think about um as you get older you you people solidify more and more like i'm this person i'm this way this is we become a little more like focused or narrow and you know you people need that kind of something like that to open themselves up again to add sort of playfulness into their life and it's something that i got from like zen buddhism which is like the beginner's mind and you always try and have the beginner's mind Mm -hmm. uh it's like right approach things as as like as if you'd never seen it before get rid of the preconceived notions and things like that so that allows you to play and see things in a new way see things creatively and and uh see alternatives and stuff like that yeah yeah it almost sounds it almost sounds a bit schizophrenic when we're talking about (laughs) creating an alter ego and live like as if you're living two personalities but then as a matter of fact we do that in everyday life Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I'm I'm speaking different to my son than I'm speaking to a policeman. Yeah. Or exactly. I'm speaking different to you than I speak to my wife. Right. Yeah. It all depends on that familiarity, and and on the occasion, of course. And I think uh, the sooner and the earlier you start practicing that, that actually there are different occasions where you can use different personalities or where you're using just your language in a different way to express yourself. Then I mean, that's a start. So. Um, it's not like you're going crazy and you know like okay so you you're like two face you know yeah, like yeah, yeah. from one second or dr jekyll and mr hyde or something yeah, yeah, like that yeah, no it's exactly. it's not like that and the beginner's mind the beginner's mind with being playful um i think that's the that's the key to most of the things on or, or, or that's the key to most of the things on how we should approach life mm-hmm. in general Mm-hmm. You know, of course, there are there are moments that we have to take very, very seriously when it yeah, comes to major decisions. Mm-hmm. But I think it's the, it's the best way of practicing decision making is through playing. Mm-hmm. You know, when you play, you take that risk and wow, you lose. OK, game over. Right. Mm-hmm. But there's no cost to it. But by doing that enough, enough in your life, you realize like when it comes down to serious decisions, you know exactly what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, we got like really philosophical really quickly <laughs> talking about all this stuff. Uh, but, you know, that's the whole point of this podcast. But I mean, I, I wanted to just mention briefly, kind of touching on that, that this is exactly why I wanted to have you on here. Because I know you're, you're, you think about, you don't just think about like, the dance in this little bubble and that's all it is and here's the moves and this is what you do you think about everything else and how it's connected to these other things and and you know even when you were talking about it in the beginning you were just you know you were just talking about dance in general and i know that you are really just a dancer you're not a specifically a b-boy you do popping you do locking you you've kind of done a little bit of everything right Mm. yeah like i said roller skating roller skating exactly you know and it's all kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. connected right it's all the same thing in a different way or or whatever yeah, yeah. well it's all connected to movement mm-hmm. which which goes back to again you know that i was always i always admired quality of movement what's funny is when i did kung fu i was never really into fighting i was a lot more into kata you know like i i loved you know like kicking in the air and flying around right and doing these stunts and stuff everything that looked nice you know that's what i wanted to learn i was never really into fighting yeah. you know, that's another thing yeah, yeah. I, I think that um that looking at looking at my entire dance history um you know like most of the time, most of the time 
I spent in practice rooms, of course, right? I mean, the, most dancers do, but mm -hmm. what, what I noticed myself that I really love practicing. <laughs> I really love practicing. So for me, you know, the intrinsic, the intrinsic reasons or the intrinsic values play a much bigger role than the extrinsic roles as as like you know like what am i dancing you know when you ask people what they're dancing for my reason was always that i wanted to feel good that was my main reason mm -hmm. right i just wanted to feel good and there's there was nothing you know you can imagine right like in the mid 90s there was nothing that made me feel better than when I'm, i was doing a headspin it just felt amazing right, you right. know yeah. get on your head just push once and then you spin and you spin and you spin you change shapes and whatever you want to do you drill until you know like like your like your form was so tight that you know like you had no more uh no more momentum mm -hmm. you know and and that kind that kind of feeling is something that nobody can take yeah nobody can take that away from you mm -hmm. and and i believe that um because I was always rather looking at the intrinsic values of dancing and not that the extrinsic values of dancing. I always asked myself, myself more about what made me move and what makes other people move. Mm -hmm. And it always made me look at like, how can I, how can I become happy? How can I become a happy person? And I realized just by practicing would already be enough. But of mm -hmm. course, you want some recognition. Of course, you need to make some money. Of course, you know, there are certain things involved that you need to recognize within yourself that if you really want to become happy, there are some compromises that you need to make. Right. So, yeah, of course, uh, I glow as well when I go on stage and I dance for people, mm -hmm. especially when I realize that these people like what I'm doing. You know, right. that's yeah. that's when I give it all. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, like it's it's the applause that changes a lot. And also, you know, like when you're making money and you can pay your rent and you, you know, like you can go to the supermarket and you have a full fridge. That's the most important stuff. Otherwise, all this wouldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. But um, but the, the value of how you feel when you're doing something that you really like and how passionate your work could be when you develop something that nobody has ever done before or when you take a direction that nobody has ever taken before and you're going to be able to also confront other people uh, with the, 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 the things that you were actually working on and you share and you get inspired by other people. So that whole community feeling about that, I think um, this is... This is where I find myself mostly. This is much more valuable to me than, uh, you know, when when uh, people are looking at moves and how these moves look like. So there's a big difference that I see within the dance development of today and back in the days. I mean, mm -hmm. also, you know, like back in the days, if we went to clubs, uh, mostly we were just doing step touch, step touch all night. You know, yeah. like no matter what song came, we were doing the same dance step. We were on the dance floor all night and we were dancing with our partners and we were just having fun. We were dancing alone and every everybody was just grooving. Right. And it was not like that people were showing off. There was a moment, you know, like maybe like 15, 20 minutes in the night. Maybe there were like little battles or something like that, like little yeah. showdowns. But usually we would dance all night from like 10 o'clock in the evening until three, four, five o'clock in the morning. And we would dance, 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 but just like vibing in the music and just feeling good on the dance floor. And that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Of course, there was quality of movement involved in there as well, but not as much, of course, as if you were home practicing, working on certain movements, you know, complex mm -hmm. movements that, you know, like that would stand out. Like if you would do that, and the club people go like, what you you doing shows here now or what? You know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. and and if you would have had had a dance partner, uh, that dance partner would run away from you because it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's. Um, now I lost track a little bit, but you see, um, the new generation, the, the newer generation, they watch videos. Mm. Mostly they go on YouTube and they look at certain movements where they go like, okay, I want to learn that. They repeat that video like a hundred times until they think, okay, photographic memory, I know exactly what to do now. They go to practice. 
they practice on that move then they go to the next they go to the next they go to the next so what they do is they accumulate a lot of vocabulary mm -hmm. and they do it for a certain reason and that reason nowadays is rather also that they can create videos that to inspire others and to show others how dope they are. So we're, we're delving into that whole narcissistic reason here, why people are doing it today. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, by going, you know, like more and more into that direction, also into the direction of competitions mm -hmm. where people are competing and they're battling and they go on stage with choreographies and all that kind of stuff is quite similar to that because that's also, you know, like, like, that's also an extrinsic reason because you want to show off, you want to become best with your crew and as a choreographer or whatever. And um, I just wish that people would go back a little bit deeper into how nice it actually is right. when you are right. just feeling the music and you're, you're practicing at home and you're coming up with something that you might never that you might never show off, that you might never show to anybody, but it's yeah. just something that would make you feel good. <clears throat> yeah, you've kind of just you know, which up. which goes. <laughs> oh, go ahead. You yeah, it's, of... <laughs> it's it's going. Also, it goes into. Yeah, it's funny. I'm I'm going from one to another, right? But see, when you look at our uh, the judging system that we developed for the Olympic mm -hmm. Games for breaking, yeah. when you look at that judging system, you also see that we are also taking care of that somehow. When uh, we're looking at, and I, I, you probably know because you know our judging system is based on the model of uh, mind, body, and soul. Mm -hmm. Um, when you look at that, then you realize that we want people to understand that it's necessary to look at a holistic picture of the dance and yeah. not just at the body, which would be the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the from what I know of the judging system and what I've seen and the developments and stuff as it's grown, it's really interesting. And, and you guys have done, a, in my opinion, a, a good job of trying to like you said capture more than just like Thank the you. moves that you see that kind of thing like you said the body the vocabulary what are they doing but sort of like the rest of it which is yeah the mind and the, and the soul which is hard to explain to people sometimes or hard to whatever you want to say like quantify or something like that um but i think it's a it's a right right it's a well it's, it's hard step to... to yeah to go in and uh and yeah. to try and try and yeah, do it with his i system. i think i i yeah and i realized you know that no matter what we if you would have to explain people anything mm -hmm. if you if you do like for instance for me right now right if i do not explain things with the concept of the mind body and soul i realize that pretty quickly i would forget to mention vital parts mm -hmm. Like, uh, let's just let's just talk about breaking, right? So now you would have to explain what breaking is. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when you hear people in interviews, they only mention moves, mm -hmm. which would only be the body. And this <clears throat> is what I'm talking about. If you only mention the moves, a big part is missing. So mm -hmm. um, what is breaking about? They go like, oh, yeah, you know, it's, you know, people, it's, it's based on top rock and then down rock and you have freezes that would probably be like you know the the, the stuff that most people would talk about first mm -hmm. and you know like in down rock you have all these crazy moves on the floor where people are doing footwork and then you have power moves as well where people are flying through the air and you have like flares and windmills and so on. so they start with vocabulary and explain how people spin on the head and stuff so but that's all the body so the next thing is like you know like, so now you've explained what people are doing and maybe also where they are doing it they dance on the ground you know mm -hmm. what i mean at first it's top rock and then it's down rock. so where are they doing it they they doing it standing up in the room and then they go down on the ground and maybe you know like oh it's, it's called a, a street dance or whatever so where are people practicing it where are they doing it they do it everywhere no matter where you go you find them at bus stops in churches in clubs in the hallway in in the garden on the beach or wherever you know you find these guys everywhere okay fine so that's the what and the where so the next thing would be you know you have to ask yourself but how are they doing it and who is doing it 
So that would be the next. So you have to like, okay, so the dance form is called, uh, way back in the days it was called b-boying. So who is doing it? Yeah, so pre predominantly back in the days, it, it was developed by guys, right? So that's why it was called b-boying. But, you know, there's many b-girls there too now. Um, so that's why it's called breaking. You know, like, so you, you delve into something else. And how are they doing it? Oh, yeah, there's not just like real style. Every person has its individual style. So you add something. How important is that when you think about it? You know, and this is where it's getting scary, especially when you think about the Olympic Games. That's what everybody's afraid of, that it's going to be generic and everybody's going to look the same, right? Mm -hmm. That's what everybody's afraid of. And that's why we need to stress that even more, mm -hmm. that, people, that people keep that individualism within the dance. Yeah. You know, so you need to be creative. That's what this is all about. We want to see people getting creative, you know, like artistic, do something new, uh, be spontaneous, especially in a battle. What's your response to what this guy has done? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just do something on the spot you've never done before. That's what we want to see. So that's the how and the who. Right. And then you go like, and, and why are people doing it? And that's where we get to the soul. Why are people doing it? And how can people forget the music, you know? It's like, why are people doing it? Oh, they, they dance to the music. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. They dance to the music. Thank you very much. Yeah. What kind of music? If we wouldn't have the breaks, where would we be? That's why the dance is called breaking. So now think about it. So if people only mention the moves, you know, only speak about the vocabulary, then also our audience will only get that narrow idea of what this it's actually about we really need to be afraid that some people are coming and they say like all right we use that and that standard and this is how you're going to judge because i haven't heard of anything else before so this is how it is what you speak about musicality mm -hmm. what musicality the one why are people dancing the soul of the dance never heard of this is what i mean that's why i need we need to stress even more like, yeah so so it's it's really important especially these days where where put it that way where a lot of capital is also going into our conditions uh from people that you know like we all know if you put a lot of capital into something you also have a, a, a great no matter what community you're doing that right? so uh, and usually these people they want to have some sort of influence of the, mm. the money mm -hmm. so uh, if they want to make decisions they need to make the right decisions and they need to hire people decisions. so it's really important we stress on facts that that um entire picture of break you know it, it, it's it's, it's got to be a comprised model um what the, this whole dance is about and just a movement and you know like with the mind body and soul model it's for me in my opinion it's like the easiest way of explaining things yeah um okay it just makes me think about uh something that i was like all, all the stuff that you've been saying is really kind of uh summing up a lot of the reading that I've just been doing over the last couple of years about, you know, intrinsic oh. over extrinsic and what drives people, what motivates people and community and, uh, and, and things like that. And, and one of the things, and especially when you're talking about quality of movement and, and, uh, what makes breaking and how people are, are, I guess, like typically conceptualizing it or whatever. And, and it just made me think about, you know, like in this one book, they're, they're talking about a train and well, what makes a train? Is it the, is it the, the car and, and the doors and the metal that makes the frame and the wheels and the, tr and well, what about the track? Is that part of the train? Is that what makes, helps to make a train a train? Is a train a train if it's not moving? You know, if it's not going from point A to point B and carrying people to somewhere. And so it's kind of like touching on the point that you're making that you know, it is more than than those things that you see. It's the it's the the well, like you said, the the mind and the and the soul and and um, everything outside of the body or not outside, but that you don't see. That's maybe a little bit harder to explain 
you know, if you want to give some media outlet some like quick 10 second soundbite of what a what breaking is or something like it's hard to explain completely. Right. Um, but I, well, think I mean, I mean, I mean, since 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 words are just translations. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, but in, in on what you know, like what else can we use? You know, mm -hmm. what else is, is more eloquent than words? to use if you want to describe anything you know mm -hmm. these in these words are just translations at the end of the day mm -hmm. right and it would you, we would never we would never f be able to form a complete picture of uh, of breaking or of any dance i mean even of of anything if you if you look at it right yeah. there's so much more to it mm -hmm. no matter what it is you know and then you have different names you know you look at water and at the same time, it's H2O. But are you drinking H2O or are you drinking water? You know what I mean? Yeah, right? yeah. It's like, yeah, it's uh, it, it becomes very, very difficult, very difficult. Mm -hmm. But I think it's something that needs to be done more in in the breaking world. And I would probably say in the dance world in general is just more people kind of trying to express this in other ways that are not purely movement and and i think that helps people who are outside of the commun community like get some sense of it gives them a way of kind of interacting with it other than you know just purely watching or trying to do it themselves like you know good communicators are 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 i think essential for for growing a community and and growing it to to reach new audiences and stuff like that as well it's tough in days of social media you know when you yeah. think about how powerful it is and how many people without the knowledge but uh, that have a big status in the community um can kind of like also ruin things quite quickly just because they have a different opinion even mm -hmm. though they don't have the knowledge but they have the say mm -hmm. yeah so that's another thing where we really got to be careful with you know there's yeah. there are people that are working very hard to accomplish something and there's others that just you know by will uh, easily they can ruin everything that your task is about and that you try to accomplish so um, we need to be careful with that mm -hmm. um, definitely uh, i want to yeah talk a little bit more about the the trivium system and just sort of like maybe i'm sure you've done this multiple times now like hundreds maybe <laughs> i don't know but uh do you mind just giving people a a brief overview of what the system is and just kind of like why you think it's it's uh what it does that's maybe the current systems are lacking uh, yeah um okay um as brief well, as you can when well, when you look when you look at the current judging system that we use in the world, um, it's most of the time either people pointing to the left or to the right, or even like coming up with a tie. Mm -hmm. um, so, to start with that, we in the trivium system, or also in the threefold system, because the threefold system is basically, you know, the 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 uh, the, the the threefold system predates the trivium system and is not as complicated as the trivium mm -hmm. the trivium system is the system that we used for the youth olympic games uh, where the threefold is just based on the mind body and soul it has three criteria not even criteria let's call them domains mm -hmm. yeah and uh, the the trivium system has six so we doubled them or basically we divided them mm -hmm. so they they became double um so we kept it we kept it in the way where um the system is also based on direct comparison, mm -hmm. which is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because within the direct comparison, you don't need to have any standards, which is really, you know, like when, when you look at most standards that we have, and if you would create standards for, for breaking or any other dance, then it, it would really choke creativity. Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, with with a standard, you would kind of dictate what, you know, like, so if we would create a standard, we would dictate the dancers what they have to do, which is bad. Yeah. Yeah. We want people to break, of course. So within the vocabulary of breaking or 
whatever category. Um, and that's it. You know, now express yourself, create an argument, basically create an argument and have a, have a debate on stage, which is what we call a battle. Mm -hmm. So, and now you have the judges judging and they would have to decide which side won. Um, when you just point to the left or to the right, then it's an absolute decision, mm -hmm. which is also bad. It doesn't give you much feedback, you know, and, uh, uh, the more detailed feedback is, the better it would be for the participants, the better it would be for the audience, and uh, also for the judges to find out who knows how to judge and who doesn't. Um, otherwise, you know, sometimes a judge might just take a quick guess and like sleep through the battle and just go like, oh, okay, three to one. Let me just go with the right, to the right or to the wrong. You know, like no questions asked, no nothing. There's no further feedback. Just so you just have this, this uh, let's call it uh, outcome feedback, where at the end, you know, like you know whether you won or whether you lost, and that's it. Nothing else. Right. So with the with the three for starting with the threefold system, um, we are using crossfaders. Crossfaders where you're going to either side. So now you kind of like you have a balance and you go with different ingredients. So we have three ingredients in the threefold, the mind, the body, and the soul uh, translated into the mind is artistic quality. Uh, the soul is interpretive quality and the, the body is uh, physical quality. So you balance it out. You look at the ingredients and you find, uh, you, you look for imbalances. That's what you do. And that's all you do. You look mm -hmm. for imbalances in these three value <clears throat> values, and then you find out by moving these three faders uh, into either direction, you find out who's the winner. Sometimes, you know, like if you if you are really not sure, like let's say you you are, you you look at two domains, you look at artistic value and in physical quality. Sorry, in, in artistic quality and physical quality, and for you these are even. It's like there's no difference. Then sometimes just in, in one domain, you, know, you just move it one millimeter and it's enough mm -hmm. to announce a winner, mm -hmm. you know, which is good. And especially if the other judges that are with you, if they have a, a, the same outcome, if they made the same, if they have the same assessment, then it's even more beautiful mm -hmm. because it means that it's pretty coherent, right? Mm -hmm. So now you could see, you could see, you know, as a participant, you have the possibility to look at the statistics and find out what was the other dancer actually doing better than me? Where where uh, did I dominate? Um, you find out which judge was incoherent with the others and organizers should have a look, you know, like who they should hire for the next competition, mm. you know, whether the judge was making sense or not. Because right now, you know, there's no there's no feedback for the judges either. Mm -hmm. never yeah. really and there's no there's no complaints anything people just like they leave and that's it well, you know and YouTube comments, good. there'll be complaints for sure oh yeah 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 sometimes yeah what were the judges thinking or yeah, whatever so, yeah. biased. so but now you have the possibility through yeah through these systems you have the possibility to look into it and find out whether the judges are biased you find out um um, what you've done good, what you've done bad as a dancer, and the audience also gets more of it. You, you've probably seen that, you know, five judges all point into one direction and everybody goes like, whoa, what the hell is going on there? It wasn't, it wasn't that blatant, you know, like from a decision. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, if you can only make an absolute decision, then everybody has to, everybody has to, has to point into one direction. Yeah. You cannot point half into one direction, you yeah. know, yeah. you point into the direction where you, th where you think uh, the side won. So, but it may be that all five or seven judges that in their mind thought like, oh, that was a really, really close battle, but I give it to the right side. Yeah, yeah, but it looks crazy when all, everybody's just going, Oof. yeah, you know, so, so, and this is, I think, you know, like what makes the biggest difference uh, from our judging system, the way we created it to uh, all the others that I've seen that first of all, we don't use any standards because it's unnecessary. Mm -hmm. If you just use these ingredients and you, you look for imbalance, that's it. The same way as uh, if you want to find out who's taller, you or me, you just put ourselves, you know, you put each other, you know, put ourselves back to back and you would find right away who's taller, you mm -hmm. know, take off your shoes, mm -hmm. no high heels allowed here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you just find out who's taller and that's it. You go, okay, this side won. Mm -hmm. 
taller guy. We don't need to know, we don't need to have any metrics there, like uh, meters, centimeters, inches, uh, feet or whatever, you know, like no knowledge for that and uh, no no measuring stick or anything like that, you know, because these two are battling, that's it. That's our game. That's the format. So when people are coming up with standards, then that's most of the time, their reason for standards is that um, they need to look at 20, 30 participants in a row. And in order to do that, that's a total different game. Mm -hmm. Right. If you like if, if people are, are lined up in sequence and everybody's dancing and at the end you have to find out who's the winner, that's a different game. Right. But we have battles for a certain reason. We want to find out who's better. It's always a, a different moment. It's always a different situation. You know, like we want to find out, can you cope? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so there's no there's no standards with how we judge. Um, and secondly, uh, the judges. By looking at um, by looking at the three values or domains, you always, no matter what you what vocabulary you have in your head, whatever you see, you know, like let's say you see, oh, he was off balance. You think balance? Okay, balance has something to do with uh, with uh, uh, physical uh, abilities, so it's part of the body. So you know exactly which fader. You need to you need to uh, you need to touch uh, the same thing where you oh this guy was really spontaneous so spontaneity you go wait a second spontaneous spont when somebody's spontaneous that's being creative if somebody's creative that's artistic values you know which <laughs> you know which fader to touch mm -hmm. so no matter no matter what you have in your mind you just need to learn what to map it on mm -hmm. and that's it so you always have a holistic picture. It's always done holistically where other judging system, they just come up with, I won't say random criteria, but they would come up with criteria and these criteria then um, dictate, also dictate the dancers on what they have to show. And sometimes these criteria, they are really off in their value as well, yeah, yeah. where, you know, like in the realms of mind, body and soul, you realize that each part has its uh its third you know like one third one third two thirds three thirds make it a whole mm -hmm. you know so we 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 go with percentage you yeah. know 33 percent per value mm -hmm. um 33.3.3 uh, sorry and, and so you know what i mean period yeah. three um so and that makes it also it makes it easier because if there are certain things on your mind and you do not know with other criteria that people give you, you do not know what they fall into, then it's really hard to map them mm -hmm. to these criteria. What's also, you know, and another thing that I find very important, um, which actually made me uh, create the, 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 the system with three criteria was I was really getting deeper into uh, mnemonics, um, memory technique, with Jim Quick and, you know, like I, I have a book is called uh, uh, Moonwalking with Einstein and so on okay. and on, you know, like the, like different, the Herenium and so on. And so different books where I was reading about, I wanted to find out, basically I wanted to find out because I was judging so much, how I could memorize a lot more from a battle, mm -hmm. you know, so that at the end of like seeing two guys that I would still memorize a lot better what these two actually did. Yeah. So this is this is what, and then I found out, you know, like that's not really how it goes. You don't have to remember every move that they've done. Also, that it's nonsense to think that every move should has have its own value. And you know, all these things that you're confronted with, these different systems that you needed to find out. You know, like by trying. You know, trial and error all the time. So, and then I realized that all these. Uh, these uh, memory freaks that they use that they use a technique of where everything they do they map it in threes so from phone numbers they are mapped in threes divided in threes hmm. uh, you look at certain games like stone paper scissors which might be a bit silly in that case but also you look at all these different trinities that we are confronted with especially in philosophy Mm -hmm. So you look at the mind, the body and the soul. So now you know where it's coming from. But you also look at the, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. You look at uh, knowledge, wisdom, 
wisdom, understanding, uh, you know, and so on. There's so many. There's so many trinities. Um, and they are all based on the fact that people wanted to explain the whole. Mm-hmm. And so for me, when I read that, I was like, yeah, my was perfectly for us even though what triggered it was uh, a book is called trivium <laughs> so now you know where, the, where i got it from right. uh, trivium which was mentioned first by platon by platons in his dialogues um, and he used the trivium uh, for for the arts uh, explaining the arts and and delving deeper into let's call it let's call it critical thinking mm-hmm. where he was where he was talking about it so his trinity is uh, in the trivium is uh, is grammar um sorry grammar logic and and rhetorics so basically when i'm saying anything when i'm saying something whatever my assert is about it's like i give you the grammar so now you take that grammar you put it into your mind you use logic and you use it with everything else that you know from previous talks, from previous, you, you, all the knowledge that you have. Mm-hmm. So now you use logic, whether it makes sense to you. And now you're using your rhetorics to formulate your assert, to formulate your argument or counter argument and bring it forward. And so like that, it goes into circles. Mm-hmm. What is that at the end? That's exactly what we do in battles. Right. right? Yeah. It's exactly what we do in battles. So yeah. I was thinking like, wow, how comes, you know, like I'm looking at all these parallels, but that's already, that's already more than 10, yeah, almost like 10 years ago now. Oh, wow. 2012, 2013. That's when, that's when I came up with that. And ever since then, I've been fine tuning it, finding out what really works yeah. and whatnot. But the trivium really worked. And that's why when, when the WDSF uh, asked us whether we could, uh, develop a system with uh, more than three criterias. They asked us for a system with five criteria. For five criteria, I actually, I was just saying like, all right, let's just, let's just split these criteria that we have. Let's, the, the, do, the domains, let's split them in half. Mm-hmm. So artistic, artistic quality became, um, uh, artistic quality became creativity as one value and uh, character as the other. Um, uh, oh, physical quality became technique and the other uh, variety. Uh, and um, the soul, which is interpretive quality, became performance and musicality. Mm-hmm. So like that, you still, you just still map yeah. these things to where they have to be. And that's it. So that's that's like the basic info that you should have about the judging systems that we develop. At the end, you know, the the the, the threefold, the threefold is easier to handle. But after a while, you know, like when you played around the trivia, because we also have a couple of shortcut buttons. Mm-hmm. Because you know, sometimes when you see something, instead of just mapping it to one particular thing, you need to use a couple of faders, and you don't want to have your eyes too much on the device adjusting all the faders the way you want it. So we have certain shortcut buttons for right. different things that could happen, like right. when when a dancer is crashing. If a dancer is crashing, it affects it affects all faders. So you don't want to go like, oh, he crashed, and you want to go like, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, you know, right. which takes too long. You just go with one button, duke, and you know, you get a um, you know like like a skip in minus five percent or whatever. Yeah, depending on how hard a person person crashed, because it affects all faders. Mm-hmm. So, but at the end, you know, like if you played around with it enough, uh, it becomes intuitive, like. A, like a game controller, basically, sure. you know, you don't need to, you know, it becomes very, very, yeah. it becomes very, very easy to handle. Yeah. And I guess that goes, uh, kind of goes along with something that I just see Renegade talking about it a lot, which is like actually having real training for judges, like, uh, not just, you know, okay, well, here's the system and here's the console or whatever it is, the interface and okay, have at it. Like people have to learn how to use it and actually like how to actually judge and break down what is actually going on when you're looking at the dancers and because it's very complicated right there's a lot of things going on and a lot of things that 
you got to keep track of and and i think you know you can see it in the youtube comments where people are like oh that person's yeah. biased i know this i know that but they that's exactly won. it but like that's ex yeah. that's exact that's exactly it i think you know okay on one hand you know the training on the device is necessary because you need to find out how you map things into different categories so the the hierarchy of values is very important mm -hmm. but much more before that really much more are all our cognitive biases that are yeah. in the way yeah cognitive biases and noise are much stronger than any system that you could follow mm -hmm. if you are not able i mean if you are not able to think straight and to think logically mm -hmm. what are you going to do yeah right and and most people are not aware of their biases hold on hold on one second sure, sure. i want to show you something so this is what i've done here this is like there's like uh Maybe you see this? Okay, okay. What does it say? Cognitive it says, biases. Cognitive biases. I've, yeah. I, I, I created some flashcards. Right. You know? Ambiguity effect. Exactly. And I have yeah. like those, there are in this one, I have 100, 194, 194 cognitive biases. Yeah, there's a lot. In this. And it's, it's flashcards. <laughs> you know, most of it is like if you go on if you go on Wikipedia, you find the whole list mm -hmm. of all the cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. And I still had to look at uh, at the ones that would affect me in yeah. in judging mostly. You know, there are yeah. more, and I use them in my car usually when I'm when I'm driving, when I'm traveling, and it's really boring on the autobahn. You know, like in Germany, right, right. or when you're in traffic, yeah. when you're stuck in traffic. So you just take one of these flashcards, you look at it. And you you check it out and you realize how many times you're affected by these biases in regular life. Mm -hmm. And then you also find out that, you know, like if you're not aware of it, mm -hmm. this is going to mess up your judgment. Yeah. You know, and, and and there's some other extras that I put in here, like for instance, the, the, the power move bias. We mm -hmm. all know, you know, like that if you're really into power moves, that's exactly what you want to see. So if a person is only doing footwork, you might you might think that that's not legitimate enough for you so you're biased yeah same thing goes for the footwork bias yeah. or then you have to what's always very funny and this is something that i always pointed out for for uh, you know when it comes down to the the hour system that dizzy has created because in the hour system you have one judge that, that uh, you have one judge for creativity and you have uh, one judge for Found, I think uh, I think he counted foundation yeah or fundamentals yeah yeah uh, but when you look at it when you look at it then actually the guy that is for creativity he would always point at the guy that is more creative the guy that is that is uh, is supposed to judge on fundamentals or on foundation will always point at the person that is more of a traditionalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah so basically you need one person that would decide because it's the perfect dichotomy right mm -hmm. so you have new and old basically you mm -hmm. have new and old it's the perfect dichotomy so you would have to find one judge that makes the decision between the two <laughs> otherwise you always have one guy that points into this side and the other guy that points into that side yeah, yeah which makes it which makes it a bit difficult mm -hmm. but uh, dizzy dizzy has done a, a good job you know, with uh, with the our our system, and at the time when he came up with it, it was it was a great step. It was yeah. a big step. Yeah, and I think that that kind of stuff is so necessary that people are willing to try stuff and willing to take the time to actually build something, whether it works or not. It doesn't matter. It it what matters is did it did it give you new information? Did it did it allow you to say, oh, that's that's a good way to go or maybe that's not a good way to go and and exactly that's how you innovate and, in anything yeah and we are still really like we're still absolutely we're in the beginning of mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. you know if you think about how many judging systems are out there mm -hmm. you know okay like with the with the trivium and threefold system i think altogether it was judged like 700 or 800 battles now mm -hmm. you know already um and you know like with every data that we get, we find out different things that, you know, sometimes you look at competitions and it's getting so deep mm -hmm. where you, especially now, when we, you know, like when, when you have certified judges and you know that ev now everybody knows how to map things, 
Mm-hmm. Oh man, it's so much more coherent. Mm-hmm. It's so much more coherent, you know, than when you have judges that come from total different ideas right, that right. don't really know how to map it. Right. You know, another another example, uh, you know, like recently in Sochi, um, the, the threefold was used, and uh, Jan de Schrimp from Russia, he, even though he always, at the end of the day, he was still pointing always, you know, like, like his results were always pointing mostly in the right directions. So he had the same guy as most of the other judges. But you realize from the statistics, you realize that he never touched the artistic quality button. Hmm. So, you know, I have to speak to him about this because it's either that he couldn't be bothered and he was like, mm, it's enough if I just use two. But of course, we would like to have the data to see what he's actually thinking, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or, or he wasn't sure how to map things in his mind for mm-hmm. artistic quality. Right. Or maybe he even thought like, well, I don't really want to judge artistic because it's too hard for me. You know, like, so you need to talk to people right. after the competition. Right. So also another thing that I think is really important that after every competition, there should be a debriefing mm-hmm. that needs to, because right now, okay, so now we talked about it earlier, you know, back in the days, it's just left, right, you know, which is just a very simple outcome feedback for everybody. Um, but we want to get more of an informal feedback, mm-hmm. right? So, and more informal feedback means more data in the, more information with, within the, the um, assessment of the judges. Mm-hmm. So now you can find out the different values through looking at like how the judges were looking at creativity, at, uh, at uh, physical uh, difficulties, uh, looking at uh, how you dance to the music and and whether you, you and so on and on, you know, like different yeah. things. Yeah. So you find that out within the trivium system, or you find that out within the threefold, you know, just by the way your your faders are located. Um, but that's still not enough. I still think, you know, like me as as a judge, I usually, you know, I would love to speak to all the participants that were there and give them information about where they can improve Mm -hmm. and for that a deep debriefing really is necessary Mm -hmm. so i would love to have after every competition i just wish that either the coach of the different teams you know like let's say when when it's like uh, country championships or whatever you know like european championships that all country leaders would would come to the debriefing and they would just get the information and what they think is necessary, where mm-hmm. what people were lacking in and where they dominated and so on. But at the same time to pull the judges to the side and find out what were you thinking? Mm-hmm. What were you thinking here? Because the noise that it creates, of course, not all the fader positions are always the same, mm-hmm. right? That's It's absolutely not the case because I do not really see what you see. Mm-hmm. Right. But at the end of the day, it's important, you know, that we all kind of like see that we don't repetitively do something wrong and go into a total different direction, because that would either mean that you have a completely different opinion or that you're biased. And this is what we need to find out. Mm-hmm. So and through this debriefing process, we talk about the different viewpoints that people might have. And then we need to find out whether they are legit or not. Mm -hmm. And if they are legit, it could be that it destroys the entire system and we have to come up with something new. It could happen, but that's part of the game. Yeah. And actually, and actually, but that's, that's what, you know, like it will be, it will be crazy to think, you know, like, 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 okay, we've done the system and now it's finished. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, Hey, we all, you know, like, If this is the paradigm we live in today, we all know, you know, it might change with one little information that we find out about ourselves as human beings, as dancers, as breakers, or get like even even deeper into it. You know, like something could happen today Mm -hmm. and tomorrow all of us would think different. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's why, again, like I'm I'm so glad to see that there's people out there that are really trying to just push things and and see what's actually going on dig deeper and and try and get more information on stuff and 
and create more information for for people to other people to use and build on top of and you know because that's like again that's like how anything gets built is we always Absolutely. talk about foundation and breaking right know your foundation yeah. and <clears throat> foundation is the key to creativity and all this stuff and yeah you know if you want to if you want to really create a what do you call it i don't know like an industry or something whatever it is like you got to have something to build off you got to have things to build off of right and if competitions are one one way of going about things a judging a competent judging system is one part of that foundation right and yeah it, yeah, yeah. So, and we need we we really need clarity there yeah, we absolutely exactly. need clarity there <clears throat> you know it's like if i'm thinking about if I'm thinking about how much money people can win these days, mm -hmm. right, in competitions, but then you realize these competitions are not really conducted fairly <laughs> because the judges are not schooled or anything. They're not educated, nothing. We have no idea why they're pointing in a certain mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. Then then you really wonder, you know, like they could be, you know, they, they might be corrupt. They might be whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, it's, just it, not it's clear, really... Right? Yeah, it's, it can't be that, you know, like I'm always saying that you look at breaking and how it has developed from, you know, from the 1980s until now. And uh, but judging, you know, we're still judging the same way, <laughs> yeah. you know, as in 1983 yeah. or something. Yeah. Well, I so a while back I was talking with Amjad and and, you know, he's sort of like the underground underground king or whatever you want to call it. Like, yeah you know a representative of the underground and parties and that side of that other side of breaking too right and uh you know he brought up one thing that uh, was really interesting that you know he he doesn't think that breaking really should be judged like you can have competitions and people can judge them and stuff like that but to him part of what uh really makes a breaking I guess to him was that you know it's it's really it's too difficult to judge like art art you know like mm. if you're taking it from that perspective like um or you you can try and judge it and it's that's fine but, well it it um, sounds it sounds it sounds really nice from Amja, Amja to say something like that and I I agree I agree with him to mm -hmm. a certain extent yeah but if if you put yourself to a test and a lot of people they want to compete mm -hmm. yeah and that's that yeah. that makes the difference so if yeah. you want to compete hey then it's not an you know then yeah it's still it's still this beautiful art form mm -hmm. but it's a it's a format where people mm -hmm. are competing yeah and and this is i think that's where we are going a bit into into a different direction maybe it's just one format yeah you, exactly. you probably know you probably know i'm doing theater as well mm -hmm. what is the reason what is the main reason for me yeah, to do theater exactly. what do, what do you guess what do you think it's because i want to express myself and i want mm -hmm. to show people my mm -hmm. art form now i don't want it to be judged mm -hmm. if i'm going into a theater i don't want it to be judged yeah i just want people to have a good time and they you know like to see some fine piece of art Mm -hmm. And that's it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, that's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. yeah, but if you say now tonight we're playing an artful game, we're playing an artful game. And that game is a competition yeah. where you and I, where we step against each other. And that and it's artful, of course. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at the end of the game, we want to find out who won. <laughs> that's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I think, sorry, I might have been misrepresenting what he said exactly, because I think he, yeah. he would also agree with that. that yeah. Because, you know, he's had competitions, that's his jams and this kind of thing. But I think, you know, his mentality and 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 uh, to a lot of people like breaking, it has that that other side of it, right? Where it's more just it's a party. You were talking about it, right? You would dance in the clubs. Uh, yeah. from 10 a.m. 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. or whatever. And I still do. Just last just do, last right? weekend. Yeah. Just last weekend I was at a party. <clears throat> I had to teach in in like uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a nice party and I haven't had a party in a long mm -hmm. time because of corona. So man, I was jamming until like one o'clock. <laughs> 
you know, from 10 to one o'clock, I was, I felt it the next day, but yeah, yeah I'm still doing it. So yeah. it doesn't, you know, competitions, they don't take anything away from yeah. the rest of the dance. Yeah. It's like I said, it's just another format, but yeah. looking at, looking at Amjad on the other hand, you know, like it's um, when he says that it shouldn't be judged. And then you look at him as, as a host. I have to laugh a bit, a bit because even as a host, he's judging. Even <laughs> that, as yeah. a host, he has the microphone yeah. in his hand, yeah. and he's he's saying things like, "That's fresh. Oh, that's that nice. was that was nice. That's fresh. That's, and so that's judging." And he says, like to another guy, he says, like, "Oh, this guy, look at him. He looked like Justin Bieber when he was 14 or something." Come on, man. Mm -hmm. That is not even not even is he judging on the dance, but he's also judging, you know, like on on a way deeper level. Where, where I'm going like, man, that's insulting. Do you really have to do this? You know, so it's questionable where, you know, like that cognitive dissonance mm. starts mm. or if, if that's really the cognitive dissonance that, that you inherit or if that's something you thought of because other people are saying that. Mm -hmm. Because that's another thing. You know, so many people are talking about certain things the way they shouldn't be. And then you look at them and you ask it, well, is that your thought or is that something, you know, that somebody else was putting on your mind? Because I don't see it that way. Hmm. Right. A lot of a lot of times that's really the case. Um, I'm, I'm looking at natural growth here where the more people start breaking on the planet, the more people would want to enter competitions, mm -hmm. the more people would want to live their passion mm -hmm. by creating a lifestyle that allows them to make money. Mm -hmm. You know, so looking at that, I think it's just a, the, it's just natural growth that, that people want to participate in competitions. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take anything away from every, anything. Um, also, a lot of people were afraid that when breaking go goes to the Olympic Games, that it loses a lot of its raw values. Mm -hmm. Where when I was in, when I was in Buenos Aires for the Youth Olympics, nothing was as raw mm -hmm. as going to Buenos Aires to the Youth Olympics, mm -hmm. because there were so many dancers coming from all parts of, of South America, from Brazil, from Honduras, from Panama, and so on. And a lot of people were sleeping in the streets where there was a moment where we invited them into our hotel. First, we were practicing in the gym. We moved all the, we moved all the treadmills to the side and we were just jamming there. And, and uh, another thing is that we did is that, you know, like I, we bribed the security there so that they could have an eye on some guys that we allowed them to sleep on the yoga mats. There were five guys. They would have, they would have, they would have slept on the street. Mm -hmm. They would have slept on the street. So, you know, like, and all these things, I mean, come on, that is community. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we live in. And we were dancing in the streets. There was an after party at the Olympics. There was, there was a jam. We were dancing. We were breaking. We were exchanging. We did everything else that people were always talking about when it comes down to work in the community. Yeah. We've done everything. We've been helpful. We've, we've been supportive. There was also a competition. Mm -hmm. There was also a competition. The competition was over after two hours. No, it was a bit longer. But you know what I mean? Yeah. There was a competition like BC1, like other competitions, right? So, but it was over after, like to say, you know, like four hours day one, four hours day two. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the day, we were celebrating life. We were celebrating breaking, you know, like as a lifestyle mm -hmm. with everybody that came from far away. And we went to eat. We went to have a drink. We went to dance. We did everything, you mm -hmm. know. So um, I don't know what these people are talking about. Just because they see certain videos and these videos only cover whatever, you know, like what... Um, Sorry, man, phone is ringing. Mm -hmm. just, just because these people, you know, like, of course, people are not interested in covering uh, how people are sleeping in, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, you, you don't see that the same yeah. way as you don't. When you're watching a movie, you also don't see your actors going to the toilet. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. People are not interested in that. It would destroy the story, right? Not all the so, time. Come on, you know, <laughs> like just <laughs> not all the time. Exactly. It's something we don't really want to see. Yeah. 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 But it is part of life, and um, and I think these competitions 
they are still connecting the world no matter what it is and yeah, it's yeah. just it's just in another way of expressing what you want that's it yeah and i think uh you know every i, I don't think any, most people are again there's a few very vocal people who are like oh, i hate i hate the olympics i hate breaking it's uh the, you know this kind of thing but i think there's a lot of people that really see it as, like you said, it's just another avenue. It's another part of the whole breaking picture and and competitions are just a part of it. Like you said, you have the mind, body and soul. In breaking, you might have, you know, competition, party and community or something like that, you know. So, it, again, it's just uh, the way I see it is it's it's another part that that should be explored, that should, you know, be looked at and of course you can't forget about the other parts and those should also be explored but they don't work without the other the others right and so like you said you know the olympics and and i've i've talked with some people even you know amjad was saying in russia in the world well, i forget what it was the world uh, dance federation something or other that was the same thing it was very much a party vibe even though it's kind of sort of connected to this olympic kind of uh avenue or competition avenue mm -hmm. and uh, in canada they had a recent uh yeah canadian version of that and it was very much the same as much as you can during these times of you know covid and stuff like that right but, uh you know and one of the organizers was saying uh, vicious he was saying you know give me non-covid times and it'll it'll represent breaking you know exactly yeah. how people want it right and so yeah. i think yeah. You know, you, you get the the right people involved that it's, I think this is, uh, this goes with what you were saying earlier with, um, you know, intrinsic drive and what motivates people and things like that. And if you, if you get the people that are there for breaking, to represent breaking the right way, they're going to do it no matter what, whether they have to do an Olympic competition, they're going to, hopefully they'll try and, uh, and bring in the whole picture as much as they can, you know, and not, not, uh, you know, bend to corporate interests or, you know, television advertising, things like that, you know, the people will stick to their guns and, and represent it the best way. And it seems like that's right. the case, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes and yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, same here, same here. Yeah. And I, and again, you know, it's, it's just one more step on the ladder. Mm -hmm. I think when it goes to the Olympic games and mm -hmm. there are so many formats in the world of, you know, like you look at all these different events that exist from IBE to battle of the year to freestyle session, R16, not anymore, but still. Mm -hmm. it's funny you know like a couple of times i remember you know like i went to a couple of r16 and i remember this one time there was no after party mm. at r16 it was at the at the world fair um in in incheon or something and then after everybody went back to the hotel and, were, and they were like what happened you know like there's no after party mm. what happened to hip-hop you know and then jo john jay john jay organized some mason night and he put it in the park and they organized two speakers, so at least there wasn't. But and and I also think it's always about being spontaneous like that. If yeah. there's something missing, this is also part of our culture. This is also part of what what the community stands for. Is there some? If there's, if you see there's something missing, be helpful. Mm -hmm. Be helpful. Support and try to organize whatever you think is necessary to make this a better moment. Mm -hmm. you know so if there might be no after party organize one if there if there you know like uh, you know like it's the same you know like in all sorts of way you you could also look at it as you know like how people how people became entrepreneurs just because there were certain things missing in the community right yeah very true. so at, at, at ibe at ibe after a while you know you had the feeling oh man there's there's no decent food around here so mm -hmm. 
Tyrone hired a couple of food trucks and he realized that was the best idea, you know, to just get some food trucks and there would yeah. be constant food, good food, yeah. Yeah. much better than what was uh, available in, mm -hmm. in Ireland at that time. They mm -hmm. only had a McDonald's and another, another um, Asian food joint there, yeah. which is funny. So, uh, you know, if you, if you think something is missing and be valuable to the community, to the culture and yeah. make it happen, yeah. that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, that's a really good point that I think more people need to hear and, and not be afraid to, uh, take it upon themselves to do it. You know, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people that do it, but you know, it, it takes work. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, I think that's maybe a good spot to, to finish up for now. Uh, okay. You know, there's there's a lot more that I wanted to talk to you about, but you know, you're a very storied man. You have a long history and yeah, cool. Hey, anytime a, again. Yeah, yeah. Anytime so, again, yeah. Let's so, see. So yeah, we didn't even really even get into any of the backstory of of how you became Storm, or we got a little bit, little taste, a little taste. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's the one thing that that uh, you know I really enjoy too is just hearing the stories of of people and where they came from and, and how they, you know, you get an idea of where their thought process, how it developed or how their, their way of approaching the dance developed and stuff like that. And, mm. you know, it comes back to what you said, there's moves and you can describe the moves, but there's the stuff that's all around it that contributes to the moves that helps develop those moves or whatever. Right. And, uh, you know, I think, stories are really really useful to um capture so we'll, we'll try and get that some of those next time <laughs> okay cool yeah. yeah yeah but uh i really appreciate it storm for uh you taking the time to just share your thoughts on on everything and you know you're you're one of the i don't know in my opinion one of the few deep thinkers in in the dance and and i really appreciate that you exist within the community to help push people. Yeah. Also, push that also, if if there might be, if there may be some questions, you know, that people are asking after watching the podcast. Um, also, I mean, maybe they could email them to you and then. Uh, yeah, or you, this will be on you YouTube so out. people can put them in the comments and. and that All right, one. cool. Yeah, let's do and that. You're active on YouTube every once in a while maybe yeah we'll... let's let's do that just send just send me the link then i'm going yeah. to check that out and, yeah, then, yeah. and then we will see that's a nice yeah. one i haven't done that before yeah so yeah we'll see what happens great but okay uh, thank you so much storm and uh, thank you everybody for watching and listening and we'll see you in the next one peace nice great day